Real fact number 108, you burn more calories sleeping than watching TV. Snapple. Now, that's just fun to say. It's a cool name. Early on, the company had plans to release this carbonated apple juice that never made it to market because all the caps started exploding off of them. I wish I could have seen that, but the name they thought of for that drink was Snapple. They later made that the name of their line of juices, and over the years, it's become the name that we associate with them. But do you want to know the company's original name? Because I'll warn you, it's way on the other side of the cool meter. Unadulterated food products. Yeah, the name wasn't too good, but it started out in an interesting way. It was three guys, Greenberg, Marsh, and Golden. Greenberg operated a health food store, while Marsh and Golden operated a window washing business. They all knew each other. Marsh and Greenberg had known each other since they were young, and Marsh and Golden were brother-in-laws, so in 1972, the three came together with the idea of starting a business that sold these healthy, natural fruit juices to health food stores. Greenberg owned one, and they just started popping up everywhere, so it seemed like a good business. For a while, it it was really just a part-time thing. It existed for the next 15 years with some local success, but in 1987 is when things really started to happen. That's when they sold their first iced tea, and as I think we all know, Snapple is known for their iced tea. They discovered this method of heating it and then bottling it while it was still hot. I don't know the science behind it, but it tasted good and it had no preservatives, and that separated them from anything else out there. The next year, they introduced their lemon-flavored iced tea, and within another year, they were up to 53 flavors. From here, their sales were basically doubling every year. By 1991, they were up to about 100 million. Now, let's take a step back and look at what's happening here. It's 1991, and four years ago, they weren't even selling iced tea. Now, all of a sudden, Snapple was a major part of that market. The demand for iced tea was higher than ever, and Snapple had a version of it that was different than anything else out there. The company Lipton had led that market for a long time and continued to do so, but Snapple Apple was chipping away at it. That year, Lipton controlled 37% of the market, whereas Snapple was around 19%. Plus, consider in New York, the biggest city in the country where they were based and focused most of their efforts, they were doing even better. There's some obvious potential here. I would think that if they can somehow expand and target other major cities or even regions of the country in that same way, they can potentially become the new leader in each one. I don't often get the opportunity to use blacksmithing reference so I'm not going to pass this one up. You gotta strike while the iron's hot. But how do you do that? The ownership of the company had yet to change in any way. It was still fully owned by those same three guys. In 1992, they teamed up with an investment banking firm where they agreed to sell about 70% of the company. As part of the deal, they would receive $45 million in addition to an annual salary of $300,000 per year for each one of them for the next five years. Plus, they wouldn't give up control. Now, they had money and were ready to try to become a national brand. They hired a new ad agency, launched a national ad campaign, and within a little more than a year, they were distributing their product in all of the major cities across the country. Real fact number 312, a flea can jump 30,000 times without stopping. Now, we have a rapidly emerging brand in a desirable market. In 1994, their sales were up to 700 million. Just eight years ago, that number was 3 million. Sounds like the kind of business that I want to be a part of is what Quaker Oats said in 1994. Quaker Oats had a lot going on, but the thing that's relevant here is that they owned Gatorade since 1983 and actually helped build it into the massive brand it is today. Maybe they can do the same thing with Snapple. It might even be easier. The brand is already well on its way up and they already have Gatorade so they can maybe help each other, take advantage of existing equipment or distribution channels, maybe market them together. There's potential. Quaker Oats must have seen high potential because the 1.7 billion that they paid for it was thought to be tremendously overpriced. But at the same time, they thought that premium was worth it. It was not. <laughs> this did not go like they had hoped. In fact, I challenge you to find a single person who thinks that this was a good acquisition. And that's because the Snapple brand ran into some major troubles almost as soon as all this happened. And I can identify three reasons behind it. For one, 
competition. The ice tea market was growing fast, and Snapple was smart enough to enter it early on and get a jump start on the competition. But now, the competition was catching up. Huge brands like Coke and Pepsi were getting involved with other tea brands to launch new products, along with new businesses trying to get in on it, notably Arizona. The guys behind Arizona have said that Snapple inspired them to enter the market. Arizona sold their first iced tea in 1992, and by 1994, they were a major threat. I actually made a video about them that talks about some of their efforts to draw customers away from Snapple, but one of those ways was offering a significantly larger can for the exact same price. In 1993, before Quaker Oats became involved, Snapple was the number one ready-to-drink iced tea brand with almost 40% market share. By 1996, they were down to number three with a 15% share. The next reason? Selling locations. Snapple used to be sold almost exclusively at convenience stores and other places like that, one bottle at a time, but now it was being sold at the supermarket and pretty much everywhere. Instead of grabbing a bottle as you go about your day, Quaker Oats was trying to make it into something that you buy a case of and drink at home, which wasn't how people perceived it, and they didn't do a good job in altering that perception. As a result, the sales suffered. The third reason, do you know the Snapple lady? And I admit, this is a bit of an excuse to talk about her because I love this. In 1993, before Quaker Oats, Snapple started running a series of commercials that featured this woman named Wendy Kaufman. They were very successful. The premise was that she would read and answer fan mail or questions sent to Snapple with an upbeat, wholesome attitude. It's actually quite a turnaround from some of their previous campaigns. And it's interesting to mention that before any of these commercials, Wendy was actually a typical employee over at Snapple. One day, she just took it upon herself to start answering their mail. She said the reason was because when she was younger, she sent some fan mail to a celebrity and she never got an answer, and so she felt bad for these people that weren't getting answers. The ad agency thought that was an interesting angle and started producing commercials around it. I do think there's a good lesson here in kindness and taking initiative. There is no way she imagined that answering these letters would help her in any way, let alone put her on television. As far as I can tell, it was a selfless act. So maybe take Wendy's example and do something like this every once in a while. What goes around comes around, you know? But anyway, people loved her, the campaign was successful, and you can say it contributed to Snapple's growing popularity during that time. In 1995, soon after Quaker Oats took control, they got rid of the Snapple lady. It's hard to say how much they were impacted by it, but they got rid of a lovable, successful character and failed to replace her with anything memorable. This whole thing was really bad for Quaker Oats. When they bought Snapple, they took out a fair amount of debt, and that motivated them to restructure a little and sell off a few things. Then it eventually became apparent that the brand had lost around a billion dollars in value. In early 1997, two years and three months after the day they bought it, Quaker Oats sold it for the price of 300 million. As the LA Times said, 1.4 billion dollars is down the drain. They also point out that that means they lost 1.6 million dollars for each day they owned it. That loss caused the company's overall income to plummet for that year, an overall 931 million dollars loss, of which they say is caused by Snapple. This made the investors unhappy. It motivated them to change their CEO and other management, which led to more changes. For Quaker Oats, this was a complete disaster. Honestly, for a company as big as they are, it's shocking to see that something like Snapple at that time could impact them as much as it did. Oh, real fact number 417. All polar bears are left-handed. I don't even exactly know what that means. The company that bought Snapple for $300 million was Triarch, and they did pretty well with it. Quaker Oats was ready to be done with it. Their investors were unhappy, they wanted to move on, which gave Triarch the opportunity to scoop it up at a pretty good price. And they identified the mistakes that Quaker Oats made, or maybe they just felt like they needed to undo everything that Quaker Oats did. Do you know when you're typing and something strange happens and you can't figure out what you did, so you just hit that back button a few times? That's essentially what they did. They couldn't do much about about the competition, but they switched their focus back to convenience stores and they hired back Wendy. She wasn't in the commercials like she used to be, it was more of a good faith thing, but she would pop up at places to promote the product every once in a while. These changes were moving things back in the right direction. The evidence to show that is in the year 2000 when Triarch sold the brand to Cadbury Schweppes. They agreed to pay $910 million in cash, accept $420 million in debt, and paid $120 million for options that combined to a price of over $1.4 
4 billion. I should note that Triarch owned some other beverage brands that were transferred in the deal, but Snapple was by far the most notable. Based on some of these acquisition prices, I think we can say Triarch at least undid the damage by Quaker Oats. Real fact number 677, a full-grown tree produces enough oxygen to support a family of four. To finish off the Snapple story, in 2008, Cadbury spun off their beverage brands such as Dr. Pepper and Snapple into their own company called, well, Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. That's all recently become part of Keurig, but it's all going strong. You can go out and buy some today if you want. It remains competitive in the market. It's still one of the leading ready-to-drink tea brands. It hasn't ever returned back to number one, but they're perpetually in the top five. They recently switched to plastic bottle... Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Snapple? You got the Snap, you got the Apple, seamlessly combined into one word. What else do you want from a name? But also, what do you think of the tea itself? It may be a little pricier than Arizona, but it seems competitive with a lot of the other brands, so is it worth it? I mean, it is made from the best stuff on earth. <laughs> Also, do you agree with these reasons for their fall? Something like that can be hard to pinpoint, but I feel pretty strong about them. I mean, why would you get rid of the Snapple lady? Oh yeah, and what do you think of Wendy? <laughs> I'd like to hear what you have to say. Real fact number 842, vanilla is used to make chocolate. <laughs> Thank you for watching.